Hello, my name is Charlie Redpath and I'm the coordinator for the Canadian Food Grains Bank project here in Medicine Hat. I want to welcome each one of you to this appreciation night we're having. Uh, this evening is a celebration of last year's events and to bring you up to date with the events of this year. For those that don't know about the Canadian Food Grains Bank, it is a non-profit organization made up of 15 different church uh, units. They are dedicated to provide food insecurity, or food security, I mean, food assistance and nutrition to developing nations around the world. We have worked in over 40 nations this past year. There are three grow projects in this area, and uh, they're at Medicine Hat, Tabor, and in the county of Newell. At this time, I would like to invite Bob Dykstra to come up and tell us about the project that they have in the county of Newell. Thanks, Charlie, for that introduction. I'm Bob Dykstra. I bring greetings from the Westfield Growing Project. And uh, I guess it's always a reason for celebration, especially at a time like this. I don't have the seating one here. For some reason, it didn't. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's good. And uh, we're celebrated our 20th year of a growing project in our, in our area there. And the history of that goes all the way back to a couple called Eddie and Muriel Luca. And uh, they challenged Al Schusler 20 years ago, or she did, because actually the land belonged to her. And it was a quarter section of land. It's three miles south of the 40 mile park turnoff. If you know where the 40 mile park is, you go another three miles down the road and it's on the left hand side. And Muriel said to Al Schusler 20 years ago, he said, if you start a project on this piece of land, you get to use it for as long as you're there, or as long as, and we're into the next generation because Ed and Muriel are no longer with us, and uh, the daughter that's taking care of the land or inherited, I don't know how it went, it, uh, it was a smooth transition and, and uh, we're very thankful that it's, it's a part of their, for that continuity, but it's also part of that heritage that, that the next generation has taken over. Um, this year we seeded 160 acres. We have the same 160 acres every year. It's dry land. And uh, we seeded 160 acres of Durham wheat. It was a good crop. So we got the harvest pictures now. Um, that, we seeded the crop on May the 5th. And uh, it probably, once it, it was seeded, it never really looked back. And on September the 16th, it was ready to harvest. and. We've always had great support from everyone around there, but this year our friends from the Hutterite colonies in Kings Lake and Shamrock came to do the combining. And I know one of the colonies was in the country helping somebody else out, so I think there was three red ones and three green ones. <laughs> but it was, it was a fantastic day to take off a real good crop, 50 bushels an acre, and uh, we binned it in a in a nearby farm there because it used to be years ago for those of us who somewhat like the wheat board that we'd be able to haul it right to the elevator but we're binning it and we had we had a target price set on it that I imagine if it doesn't get picked up here a little bit Al said to me the other day he said well there's people that need that worse than we do so we probably have to readjust the target one of these days um, I guess Al couldn't be here tonight and just like always, I'd like to thank him and his brothers. They, they uh, head this all up every year. There's uh, the seed, the fertilizer donated. There's other donors as well that I won't start mentioning because everybody comes and, uh, and helps out. That picture there, that was the day we harvested and uh, we were actually front page, front page of the commentator and I actually thank the lady at the commentator for uh, quickly getting this together for me. This, today actually because 
Al left this week on, he was going to be here, but then he left on a holiday. So that's his brother Bert in that, I don't know, I guess a man-sized drone. <laughs> so, but I think most of all, we're thankful that God allows us to do this kind of work. And, and uh, we're so blessed here. And uh, we've never had a crop failure in 20 years. And I think uh, there's, there's a reason behind that. So we're, we're very thankful and enjoy sharing that with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, looks like we're going to have a video from Newell Food Grains. to keep you too long but I'm going to talk about the Medicine Hat and District uh, grow project that we have here. Our project is located on the north side of South Boundary Road and this has a sign on it indicating where the project is and it's just east of Desert Bloom area. I get overwhelmed when I think about the things that have happened that I have no control over. We have had terrific cooperation and support from numerous businesses and people in the area. One year ago, I had a special request. I asked that when you were out driving and you see a farmer working in the field, that you should pray for him and his family, and also the Medicine Hat and District Growing Project. Thank you for doing this, and how quickly it worked. 
Shortly after our supper last year, I received a phone call offering us the land to the north of where we are providing crop that are used to help in third world nations. And I accepted that offer. So this year we will be increasing uh, what we're farming out there. We continue to do this with uh, our next door neighbors, the Wises, who are awesome. They do the seeding, the spraying, South Country Co-op and several chemical companies look after the, the weeds. And I have a question for you. Do you remember August the 23rd, 2016? We harvested 2,397 bushels of wheat that day, valued at $16,315.58. But we were out there and it was rainy and windy, there was a strong west wind, and uh, there was rain clouds came on the north side of the field, and at one time we couldn't see the uh, teepee, it was so rainy. And the guys, one of the guys from John Deere came to me, and they were sitting waiting to combine, and he said, should we go? I said, have you got a monitor on your combine so you can tell us how wet the grain is? He says, we do. I said, well, let's try it. So they come back and they told me it was the grain tested 12.5. So I said, let's go. So Case showed up when they were there and they got ready to go. So we went and uh, as I said, the rain came between the teepee and us and then it went east. Then another big rainstorm came from the west and it came across the number three highway, and then it went south. So we kept combining, and uh, about 11.30, we had a bit of a shower go through, so the guys stopped combining and stopped and had lunch, and uh, then we had a little discussion about finishing, and they told me, since I don't know anything about farming anymore, that, uh, <laughs> The straw would be wet, but the grain would be dry. I said, well, let's take it off then. So we did. And as a result of that, we collected $16,315.58. Now, the other good part about that is that the federal government matches four to one. So that makes about uh, 125,000, 126,000 dollars that was looked after that day to feed people in a third world country or provide whatever they needed. So I ask you, uh, as I talked about it earlier, to keep praying for the farmers when you see them out working in their fields, if you're driving down the highway or wherever. And also, pray for the Food Grains Bank projects, not only ours, but other ones around the country that you know they would be successful in whatever, with whatever they're doing. And I got an article on the computer the other day that said there's over a million acres of grain from last year that hasn't been harvested yet. Now that tells me a lot. We've got a lot of farmers that are going to be out harvesting this spring before they can seed. And it is going to be a difficult time for them, I'm sure. And not only that, under the crop that will be laying flat, it will be muddy. And so it's just another problem for them. So having said that, uh, I'm going to call on Andre to introduce our speaker, and uh, we will go from there. Well, good evening. It's, it's a real pleasure <laughs> to be here this evening. and. Uh, I want to thank Charlie and the Medicine Head Growing Project uh, 
for all the work they do. Uh, besides growing a crop for the Canadian Food Grains Bank and donating those funds uh, to the Canadian Food Grains Bank every year, they also raise funds here at these events, and, and we're very thankful for that. And we're thankful for the federal government as well for, for matching those funds. In Alberta, we have about 35 growing projects, like we saw in, in Madison Head here, in Newell, in uh, Burdett, and, and, and we have them all over Alberta. And, and it's all groups of farmers that get together and grow a crop for the Canadian Food Grains Bank and donate the proceeds to people that do not have enough food to eat. I have a little video and it just gives a little bit of an uh, overview what we did in Alberta. It takes uh, just a few minutes, so I'm going to show that first.
the goal of the Canadian Food Grains Bank is to end hunger, to end global hunger. And, and we have made progress uh, over the last 25 years. There are fewer people that are hungry and starving to death. But just last Friday, the United Nations announced that the world faces the last, largest humanitarian crisis since the United Nations was founded in, with more than 20 million people in four countries facing starvation and famine. The UN Sec Security Council said that without collective and coordinated global efforts, people will simply starve to death and many more will suffer and die from disease. The United Nations is urgent an immediate injection of funds for Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, and Northeast Nigeria, plus safe and unimpeded access for humanitarian aid to avert a catastrophe. Without a major infusion of money, the United Nations said, ch children will be stunted by severe malnutrition and won't be able to go to school. Gains in economic development will be reversed and livelihoods, futures and hope will be lost. In, in Yemen, there are more than 7 million people that are hungry and don't know where the next meal will come from. In South Sudan, the world's newest nation, this has been ravaged by a three-year civil war. The situation is worse than it has ever been. This, this, the famine in South Sudan is man-made. Parties to the conflict are parties to the famine, as are those not intervening to make the violence stop. More than 7.5 million people need aid, and about 3.5 million South Sudanese are displaced by fighting. In Somalia, more than half the population need humanitarian assistance and protection, including 2.9 million who are at risk of famine and require immediate help to save or sustain their lives. Close to 1 million children under the age of five will be acutely malnourished this year. And in northeast Nigeria, a seven-year uprising by the Islamic extremist group Boko Haram has killed more than 20,000 people and driven 2.6 million people from their homes. To be clear, we can avert a famine. We ready, despite incredible risk and danger, but funds for these countries are needed now. Currently, the Canadian Food Grains Bank is providing emergency food assistance to conflict-affected people in Somalia and South Sudan. In and around South Sudan's capital, the city of Juba, where many people have sought safety, that response is done to the Canadian Food Grains Bank member, World Relief Canada. In Somalia, the Food Grains Bank is responding through the crisis there through its member, Erdo. The women, men, and children in South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, and Nigeria are not forgotten, and they need urgent help. Further, immediate assistance is needed to ensure the famine does not spread. Tonight, you will have the opportunity to make a donation, and I, I encourage you to consider that and, and to make a donation to the Canadian Food Grains Bank. We also ask you to pray for peace in these countries. So let us all pray now. God of all grace, who in Jesus Christ I thirst, hold the people of Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, Northeast Nigeria, in your infinite love. Be with those for whom the earth's resources have run dry. Be with those 
who must walk for miles to find that daily bread, be with those for whom survival is a fragile hope, and be with us as we read the stories of those who bear such acute suffering. Give us hearts of compassion to respond in your service so that together we may see restoration where there is pain and all may rejoice in your goodness. Amen. Tonight we're really happy that, that my colleague Terence Bark is here with us. Um, as you know, I look after Southern Alberta and, and he looks after Northern Alberta. And um, I've, I've known Terence for more than, than 25, 30 years. Actually, we, uh, Terence was a farmer up in, close to Edmonton in a little town, Breton. He milked cows. And, and together we started a couple of businesses. And then uh, about seven, eight years ago, um, Terence was talking to the pastor in his church, and, and, and the pastor said, you know, hey, the Canadian Food Queens Bank needs somebody. So he came to, to me and said, hey, maybe we should do that together. Um, and that's Terence. You know, he likes to give back. He likes to, to, he cares for other people. And that's how I know him, and, and that's how I respect him. Um, he has been working. Uh, on a part-time basis with Canadian Food Grains Bank looking after the growing projects and, and donors in, in northern Alberta. And um, earlier this year, in, in January, he was able to take a group of Canadians to Rwanda. And that's what he's going to tell us about what he saw in Rwanda. Terence? Well, good evening. It is uh, wonderful to be with you here this evening. Thank you all for coming out and supporting the work of the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Even though I work in the northern part of the province, north of Red Deer, I have been down to this function several times. I think this is the third or fourth time. And I'm always amazed at the support in this community and the number of people that come out. And I know that part of that is due to Charlie and, and his work here. And so I'd like to thank Charlie and also the people who are directly involved with the growing project here. It is making a difference in people's lives. There's been some talk about how well the growing projects did in southern Alberta this year. There was uh, several people mentioned that. Well, in the northern part of the province, they weren't quite so fortunate. At the end of October, there was still 14 growing projects that haven't been, hadn't been harvested. And we were thinking they wouldn't come in until spring. And then in November, there was a bit of a reprieve in the weather. I don't know if you remember that, but there was about 10 days where the weather turned nice. And so seven of those projects came off. So currently we still have seven growing projects that are out in the field. And that poses a special problem because in the areas where the growing projects are still out, that means that farmers also still have crop out in the field. And so this spring they will be trying to get their crop off, but also in the back of their mind they are knowing that the growing project also has to come off early enough in order to get the seed in the ground for this next year. So you can remember those people in your prayers and those growing projects. Uh, we know it will be a special challenge and we're looking forward to uh, the spring and to what it brings. I am uh, guessing that most of you know very little or nothing about the country of Rwanda. And if you know anything about Rwanda, it's probably around the genocide that happened some 23 years ago, back in 1994. There's been a number of movies that have come out about the genocide, and that's usually uh, what people use as their term of reference for Rwanda. In fact, you may even think that it would be dangerous to travel to a country like Rwanda. Well, in reality, Rwanda is now one of the safest and most progressive countries in Africa, 23 years after the genocide. There's been a lot of good things happen in that time period. And there's been a number of groups uh, that have worked and are still working in the country of Rwanda. And one of those groups, one of those, those organizations, is the Canadian Food Grains Bank. And so like Andre mentioned, in January, myself and 10 other Canadians were able to go to Rwanda and see the work that's happening there with the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Now there's no question that the genocide does form the context of 
who the Rwandans are and what their country is. 23 years ago, after years of colonialism, over 800,000 people were killed in the summer of 1994, in 100 days. And so everybody who's living today either lived through that horrible time or their first generation after. And so that doesn't just go away. But there's been a lot of work around reconciliation and around healing. The government has a number of programs in place uh, with helping people to heal. And so there's many good things that are happening. And these people are now determined to put aside their tribal differences. They no longer refer to themselves as Hutu or Tutsi. And now they say we are Rwandan. And so they are determined to make their country whole again. And so as we traveled through the country, we heard that saying from many different people. As they talked to us, as they shared with us, they would say, we are Rwandan. So as I begin, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the country and uh, so it's easier for you to understand the context. Rwanda is an incredibly beautiful country, more beautiful than I had ever imagined. It's amazingly hilly. In that first slide, it said, the land of a thousand hills. And I think that's an understatement. Everywhere you go, there's hills and mountains. There isn't a flat spot hardly anywhere in the country. And uh, it's also a very small country. There's a map of Africa, and right at the tip of that arrow, is the country of Rwanda. Now when I say small, I mean it's tiny. It's very tiny. Just to show you how tiny that country is, I've colored in just over three counties, and I'm sorry that you folks can't see, but there's three counties in the bottom of southern Alberta, right in the area where we are. The counties of Cyprus, 40 Mile Warner, and about a quarter of the county of Tabor. That land area comprises the whole country of Rwanda. It's a very small country. But to even uh, make the situation more difficult, there's over 12 million people living in that country, in that small area. So in Alberta, we have a little over 4 million people. We're a much larger province. And in this little area, there's over 12 million people. Most of them are small shareholder farmers. Now, normally when you hear that term, small shareholder farmers, and we hear it a lot when, in reference to the developing world. People are talking about farmers who are farming less than five acres of land. Well, there isn't that much land available in Rwanda. And so, on average, the Rwandan farmers are farming a half an acre of land. 0.2 of a hectare or less is what their farms consist of. Over 75% of the Rwandan people are farmers. Most of them are involved in agriculture. And so um, that's where some of the issues and some of the problems begin. I said before that there's been many good things happen and much progress made in the country of Rwanda. In 2011, the Rwandan government mandated that there would no longer be any thatched roofs. Thatched roofs are a common way of roofing in a lot of African countries, but there's many problems that come with a thatched roof during the rainy season. And so the government mandated no more thatched roofs. And so, so now all the houses in Rwanda either have tin or tiled roofs. And if you can see that picture, you can maybe see the electrical wires coming into the homes there. These are typical homes made of mud bricks and then a type of stucco put on the outside. Most of them have dirt floors. Some have a concrete pad. But there's electricity in most of the homes in Rwanda. The roads that we traveled on were amazing. I've traveled in a number of uh, third world countries, but I've never seen roads like we saw in Rwanda. Many of them better than our roads that we sometimes travel on here in, in Alberta. The country of Rwanda, even though it's very small, varies greatly in the amount of rainfall it gets. So this is a precipitation map, and on the blue, in the, on the uh, left side of that picture where it's blue, that's an area that's much higher elevation. A lot of that uh, part of the country is over 7,000 feet in elevation. And that area receives about 2,000 millimeters of rain a year. But over on the east side of the country, that's a semi-arid region, the yellow region there. And they're receiving about 1,000 millimeters of rain. Now, if you're like uh, a lot of folks who still think in Imperial, that's about 40 inches of rain a year. That's about three times the amount that you would receive in the Medicine Hat area a year. 
Now you may think that you know, should be ample rain to grow a crop. In Rwanda, they don't have a winter, but they have two rainy seasons. And the rainy seasons run from March to May and from September to December. Now we were there the first several weeks in January and what the farmers are telling us is that the rainy seasons still come, but they're very unpredictable. And the rain volume is not the same as it once was. And so in the last rainy season that they had, there's a rainy season starting right now, but in the one that they had just prior to us coming, the rain only started in December and they didn't receive near enough rain. And so as we drove into the southeast part of the country, this is what we saw. Completely parched soils, crops that were drying up that were completely burnt. And you can see there won't be any corn that comes off of this, this piece of land. And that explains partly why Canadian Food Grains Bank is working in Rwanda. You can start to understand the need. Canadian Food Grains Bank, like you heard in one of the other PowerPoint presentations, is made up of 15 different churches and church-based relief agencies. Three of those organizations are currently working in Rwanda. Canadian Baptist Ministries, uh, Mennonite Central Committee, known as MCC, and ADRA, which is the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. All three of these groups are working with partners in Rwanda. And uh, when we work in the developing world, Canadian Food Grains Bank works in three ways. First of all, we provide food aid. Secondly, we help people to grow more and better food. And thirdly, we focus on nutrition. In Rwanda, you can understand the importance of these people being able to grow more and better food. When they only have a half an acre of land, and that's what they need to uh, produce food for their family, they need to be able to get as much out of that land as possible. Because a lot of the yields have been low, uh, there's much malnutrition in Rwanda. And so those last two areas, helping people to grow more and better food and nutrition, are the two areas that Canadian Food Grains Bank is working on. With helping to grow, or helping people to grow more and better food, one of the areas that Canadian Food, food Grains Bank is focusing on is with conservation agriculture. Now conservation agriculture is a technique, a way of farming that involves three main things. Minimum soil disturbance, not working the soil until all the nutrients are exposed and all the moisture is exposed to the hot sun. Having a ground cover, so having a mulch over the soil to uh, keep the moisture in the ground and to, uh, for weed control. And then lastly, crop rotation, so the crops remain healthy. And so this farmer that you see here, this was one of the first farmers that we met in Rwanda when we went out to the villages. His name is Athanase. And Athanase told us how well this conservation farming works for him. He's been involved in it for several years, and you can see how healthy his corn is. You can see the uh, cob, the ear of corn that he is holding. It's, it's very large, and his corn was very healthy. And he told us that, uh, now you should know that the beneficiaries, the people who were involved in the programming there, were people who were suffering, who were struggling, prior to the project coming to their area. And so Athanase and his family were one of the families that was struggling. And now they are doing very well. In fact, Athanase has now uh, joined a farmer's cooperative. And in that cooperative, they, now, they have now been able to buy a corn mill. And so they no longer have to pay someone to mill their corn. He's also been able to buy into a community uh, grain storage. One of the issues in the developing world is that many of these farmers have no way to store their product, their grain. And so right after harvest, they have to sell it, they have to get it to market, or it spoils. But when everybody's doing that, there's a glut of grain on the market and the price goes down. But they have no choice. Well, now Athanas has been able to buy into a, a community grain storage. He's bought shares in that. And he can store some of his corn, some of the excess that he doesn't need for his family. And he can wait until the price starts to come back up. Similar to what farmers would do in Canada. And he's able to take advantage of that, all because of the success of this conservation agriculture. So you can see how healthy his corn plants are. This picture is just showing some of the spacing of the corn. In conservation agriculture, they only disturb the soil where they put the seed in. And all of the seeds, every one of the planting stations where they put the seeds in, 
are measured and they're an exact distance apart. And so you can see the spacing on this corn and you can also see the banana leaves that have been, that have been put uh, between the plants and in the rows for weed control and to keep the moisture in the ground. Now this was a plot of land right beside Athanes' farm, right beside his plot of land. There was only a walking distance separating the two plots. And we don't know all of the farming practices that this neighboring farmer was using, but he wasn't using conservation agriculture techniques. You can see the spacing, how tight it is. There is some mulch on the ground, but you can see the difference. It's a stark difference from the corn that Athanes was growing. It's drying off from the bottom up and this will produce very little. Another one of the farmers that we met was this lady. Her name is Elise and again she told us her story about how they didn't have enough food for their family. And she started with the conservation agriculture in 2013. And she talked to us about the different spacing and the ground cover that she was using. And she was a wonderful lady. She had a, a wonderful story and she told us how since she has now in the last number of years had some excess, she was also able to buy some livestock. And so she had several goats and she also had some cattle. And then she did something that was very special for our group. After she had told us her story and she took us into her little yard and showed us her animals, she asked us to come into her house. And she took us into the little front room of her house. We crowded in there. We sat on some, mainly on some wooden benches. And she had picked corn from her field. And she shared that with us. And so that's not a great picture, but you can see us all gathered around eating the corn. And that was a very special treat. Imagine this lady who only three years ago didn't have enough to feed her own family. She could now share her bounty with Canadians who had come to see the project. It was a very rich experience for the whole group. As we traveled up into the northwest part of the country, we saw um, conservation agriculture, but we saw a different type of project there. And they were farmer field schools. So this lady in the blue, her name is Odette. She was part of a farmer field school. So they picked 32 farmers. And Odette was chosen as a facilitator for this group. And these, this group of farmers has to find a plot of land that they can rent for a minimum of three years. And then they uh, complete different field trials. So they're doing different trials with seed varieties. They're doing trials with spacing. They're doing trials with different types of fertilizer, compost fertilizer and commercial fertilizer and different combinations. And then these farmers are encouraged to take the techniques that they're learning with the field trials and use, their, use those techniques on their own farm. This fellow with the blue cap in the center of the picture is one of the extension workers working with Mennonite Central Committee there in Rwanda. He's a Rwandan national. And he told us that they know these projects are working in Rwanda. And one of the reasons they know that is because farmers who aren't involved in the project are now trying to replicate the results. And so that would be similar to farmers here. If there is one farmer in your community who is continually getting better crops, higher yielding crops, there will definitely be talk at the coffee shop. His neighbors will be trying to find out what he's doing and try and replicate it. And that's exactly what's happening in Rwanda. People are asking questions and wanting to know how to get the higher yields. I put this picture in just so you could see the height of the corn that they're growing there. It was the most amazing corn I've ever seen. Some of it was somewhere between 10 and 12 feet high. And at first we thought, well, that's not very efficient for all of that, all of those nutrients and all of the water that it takes to grow that kind of corn. Um, that can't be very efficient. But as we started to understand that mulch is often an issue in Rwanda. Trying to get enough mulch for ground cover is often an issue. And so to have 12 feet corn, there's a lot more mulch than when you only have eight, eight foot high corn. Uh, often in African countries, there's no mulch because all of the animals are roaming and eating it. They're looking for food, and the first thing they eat is the ground cover, the mulch. Well, in Rwanda, no animals are allowed to roam freely. If there's any animals grazing anywhere, they're tended by people. There's always someone there. And so that was a big difference that we saw in Rwanda. And it's made a big difference for these farmers whose land is so small 
and so precious. Odette also mentioned to us that one of the secondary benefits, if you can call it secondary, is that um, in these farmer field schools, over 60% of the, the farmers involved are women. And that may not seem like a big deal to you, but in a society that is very male dominated, it is a big deal. And another one of the ladies shared that these women who are involved in the farmer field schools now are receiving much more respect in the community. And one woman even said that some of the marriages are stronger because they're receiving more respect from their husbands. And so that was a really interesting, to, interesting thing to hear. That isn't at all what the goals of the project were, but there was some side benefits that were happening with the work that was going on in Rwanda. So that was some of the things that we saw, some of the projects that we saw that were centered around uh, helping farmers to grow more and better food. And the other projects that we saw were focused on nutrition, helping people to increase their nutrition. In a number, in a lot of the communities in Rwanda, malnutrition is a big issue. Uh, Andre talked about stunting. Stunting is actually when uh, children's bodies don't develop. They can't grow. There isn't enough nutrients for them to grow. And so uh, they actually are too short for their age. And it's permanent. There's no way to reverse that. And so when stunting occurs, um, there can be a child that looks like she may be five or six, but she could be 10 or 11. There's that big a difference. And it's really shocking when you see it. Well, the numbers are that the uh, stunting, uh, the prevalence of stunting in Rwanda is about 39 to 40% of the children are stunted meaning that there's been long-term malnutrition. So Canadian Food Grains Bank is working in a number of, of these communities trying to reverse, not reverse the stunting, but reverse the, the malnutrition. And one of the ways they're doing that is by encouraging families to grow kitchen gardens. Kitchen gardens seem very basic to us. It's a very basic principle, but most of these farm families will have, you know, a half an acre of land to grow their corn on but they always have a little bit of land, a little plot of land right beside their house. And they can use that land to grow fresh vegetables. So the, the project that's working there is providing the seed. And the goal is that families would have fresh produce nine months out of the year to try and increase the nutrition in the communities. And it's working. So you met Athenes earlier. He's one of the farmers. And he also had a kitchen garden. and so. He was telling us about his kitchen garden and him and his uh, two sons in the picture pulled or picked some of the produce. You can see that massive cabbage and the, the younger son there is holding a green pepper and Athenes is holding a carrot. But they had a variety of vegetables. They had everything you can imagine, eggplant and celery and tomatoes and onions and the list goes on. And uh, things are starting to turn around for some of these families with the fresh produce that they have. And this plant here, I don't know if you can see that very well, but we saw this plant in a lot of the kitchen garden. It's called amaranth. And I didn't recognize it. Uh, it grows very easily there. It's drought tolerant. And the leaves are highly nutritious. And so they either eat the leaves in salad form or they cook it up and mix it with other foods. But that uh, plant is actually part of the pigweed family. And so anybody who's a farmer here will know about pigweed that you try and get rid of in your fields. Well, I'm not sure if the pigweed here is nutritious, but this amaranth is highly nutritious, nutritious. And so we saw it in many kitchen gardens. Another thing that they're using in the kitchen gardens are these wicking pots. And this was a, a very uh, neat little thing that they had brought to the project. These wicking pots are uh, unglazed ceramic pots. They have a large base and then they have a narrow neck. And the large base is buried in the ground with just a bit of the neck and the opening exposed to the surface. They fill that pot with water. It holds, they hold about 20 liters of water. And then they plant their kitchen garden around it. And as the plants grow, there's actually a surface tension that's created from the roots. And it actually draws the water through the ceramic and waters the plants. And so with this project, with uh, this project, each of the families that was involved was given two of these uh, wicking pots. And they seem to work amazingly well. Now, to try and explain that even more, 
Wherever we went in Rwanda, we saw people hauling water, often for several miles to their village or to their home. Water is not easily accessible there, and it takes up much of their day. So you can imagine encouraging these people to grow kitchen gardens can create more of a burden for them. These young plants would burn up in the hot Rwandan sun. They have to water them morning and night if they're doing it manually. But with these wicking pots, the water stays in the pots for somewhere between three and four weeks with the young plants. And so it saves them a pile of work, and it's uh, been very successful. This family that we met, um, it's hard to see the wicking pots in that picture, but they were given two wicking pots, and they're relatively cheap. That's the other great thing. They're relatively cheap, and many Rwandans can even afford to buy them. And so this family had seven wicking pots. And so they had quite a large garden, and uh, they were working very well, so that was exciting to see. The last part of the nutrition program, programming that I'll share with you is these nutrition schools. Now, nutrition schools bring uh, eight to ten families together, and they have a leader, and it's basically a, a knowledge-sharing time, and they're learning about health and nutrition. And so this poor group had been waiting for us for a long time. We were delayed at a previous project, and so they were sitting in the hot sun, waiting patiently for us to arrive. And this was one of the groups. And what they do there is the, the people from each family bring produce from their kitchen garden. And then they learn how to cook with it and how to prepare food. And they also learn what we might think is basic, but they also learn what proper nutrition is and what it takes to raise a healthy child. A lot of these children that are malnourished have been living only on corn or on cassava, which is a starchy root plant, and there's just not enough nutrients in those plants alone for the children to grow up and be healthy. And so we met with, uh, with, a, with the group, and then they brought out a plate of food, and it was uh, a whole mixture of healthy foods, beans and avocado and a number of different vegetables on there. And then they were sprinkling this green powder on the plate. And there's a tree that grows in Rwanda. Well, it grows in a number of countries in, in uh, Africa. But it grows in Rwanda, and it's called the Moringa tree. And the leaf of the Moringa tree is nutritiously dense. It's filled with nutrients and vitamins. And so they pick this tree that's growing wildly. They, they don't even plant them. They're just growing all over. They pick the leaves, they dry them in the sun, and then they grind them up. And they sprinkle it on their food to fortify the food. And I understand now that I haven't seen it here, but I guess in the health food stores, you can buy Moringa powder, and it's supposed to be the new miracle food. So you can go and try it. In Rwanda, well, in the developing world, in uh, work, in development work, the phrase is often used, the first thousand days of a child's life. That's a common phrase. And that doesn't mean the first thousand days starting at birth. It means the first thousand days starting at conception. If children, even children in the womb, don't get proper nourishment, those results can be last lifelong, and maybe even into the next generation. I shared with you a little bit about stunting, and that's often uh, where the stunting starts, when the malnourishment has started right in the womb. And so that's a big focus uh, for uh, this nutrition work with young children and with nursing and pregnant mothers. So these are just some pictures of the mums feeding their children the, the plates of food. And one of the things uh, our interpreter shared with us was that the motto for these nutrition schools is that if you want to run fast, you go alone. If you're willing to go slower, others can come along. And so it's a slow process, but these people, these families are learning what it takes for, to have proper nutrition for their children and for the mums. They also had this porridge that they brought out. And I'll be honest, in the hot sun, it didn't look very appetizing. It was a porridge made of sprouted wheat, soy, vegetable oil, maize flour, and ground nuts. It was all cooked up. And they brought it out in a bucket, and then they poured it into jugs and poured cupfuls of it for all of the children. And these kids sat there and drank this porridge. And I guess it's filled with nutrients, and it's all been calculated out exactly how many calories they're getting when they, when they drink that porridge. And it's just another supplement that they're using for the nourishment of these children. Many of the health concerns in the area are precipitated by malnutrition. We met with one of the local doctors at one of the clinics, and he said that 
a number of the diseases, even diseases that we wouldn't typically associate with malnutrition, uh, the prevalence of those diseases drops substantially when the nutrition levels rise in the community. And so those are diseases like malaria, gastrointestinal diseases, and eye diseases. The rate or the prevalence of those drops substantially, and so that was good news to hear. Lastly, I'll just share with you about Odette. Odette was one of the facilitators at the field school, and after we uh, saw their trial plot, we went to the place where she lived. And you can see in the background, she also has a kitchen garden. It's a raised bed, and there's some benefits to that with water drainage, etc. And she also was using wicking, wicking pots in her kitchen garden. But Odette shared with us how tough it is uh, to live in Rwanda for some of these farmers, and that life isn't easy. And that's really the impression that we received as we traveled around Rwanda. Life is not easy for these people. She said that their family was one of the fortunate families. Her husband had a job. He was driving a bus back and forth to Kigali, the capital city. So they had some extra income. But many families didn't have that benefit. And so she talked about the difficulty of life with very little land and trying to raise their family. And somebody in our group asked Odette, what are your dreams? What are your dreams for your family? And so in her native tongue, she, she said something. And our interpreter was Brian, the fellow that was in one of the previous pictures. And as she was talking, he started to smile. And we were wondering what Odette was saying. And when she was done, Brian in English said to us, what Odette hopes for is that her children can grow up and get an education and that they no longer need Brian. <laughs> and that's really the goal of these people. They want to be self-sufficient. Right now, it's very difficult for them to do it on their own. So with the work of groups like yours, people like Odette, people like Athenes, people like Elise, and so many others around the world are experiencing what it means to be self-sufficient and food secure. Many of their children are no longer suffering from malnutrition. And often here in Canada, you know, we have been blessed and um, it's often easy to forget about those who are suffering. But I don't want you to forget the people that you met tonight on the PowerPoint presentation. Remember those people and that's the reason why uh, so many Canadians are involved in the work of the Canadian Food Grains Bank. So thank you for your work here in Medicine Hat. And thank you for coming out. Thank you.